How's it going, everybody? Antonio here for some resource talks. I'm about to show you yet another clip from the conversation I had with Doomberg a few days ago. This one highlights his opinion on uranium, natural gas, coal, copper, and uh, and even battery metals. And in a previous clip, he gave his opinion on the banking crisis and the coming recession, as well as what the BRICS nations are doing. And uh, we even ended up talking about a commodity-backed currency, de-dollarization, stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, in, in the full conversation, we also talked about other energy issues, electric vehicles, and, and some other interesting topics. So if you do want to listen to the whole thing, I share those on resourcetalks.com under the tab Early Interviews. And uh, yes, I also share them much earlier on there. That's why it's called Early Interviews. So yeah, feel free to check that out. And um, in the meanwhile, I'm going to play the intro song and let Doomberg do the talking. I want to move on to talk to be a little bit more selfish and talk about commodities here. But just before I do that, you, what's something you want to talk about? Like you go on many podcasts, you get asked pretty much every question in the book that you could get asked. Uh, there's probably nothing original I can ask you. But what, what, what do you what do you want to be asked? Like if you were interviewing yourself, I guess, what would you ask yourself? I don't know. I'm happy to talk about commodities. I can talk about energy all day. This is um, mm. this is our expertise. This is where I grew up in the industry. And, um, and we have some pretty interesting and unique views. Uh, from the inside, which I think is what makes Doomberg unique. And so, for example, the piece that I hope to finish writing today after we're done recording is going to be about the glut of natural gas in the U.S. and the causes of it and what we could do about it. And I'm really fascinated by sort of co-product economics and in this case, of course, associated natural gas in the U.S. Uh, in, in the shale patch, especially in the Permian Basin, is leading to this excess supply of natural gas and we really don't know what to do with it. And and so, you know, we we have this amazing phenomenon where in parts of the United States, there's a shortage of natural gas, i.e. California and New England, where they don't have the pipeline infrastructure to get it. But in parts of Texas, they can't give it away. It literally is, is you know, sometimes sells for close to nothing. Um, mm. And it's a valuable molecule, as we've seen. Of course, it was the genesis of much of the energy crisis of the past 18 months. And yet, in vast swaths of the United States, you can't get rid of it. And it's getting to the point where the inability to take off natural gas is beginning to affect oil production because <laughs> the incremental growth of oil is in the shale patch. And um, because of new restrictions on flaring and venting, um, if there is no place to put the natural gas, you quickly run up against the edges of your ability to produce oil. And um, one of the ways that Biden could help the U.S. produce more natural gas is to find a home. Sorry, one of the ways that Biden could um, uh, catalyze the production of oil is to find a home for the associated natural gas that comes with it uh, in the Permian in particular. Mm. And so this is really sort of the type of Doomberg piece that we love to write, teaches, sub teaches our readers something interesting about the market and highlights uh, a real a real trend. And in fact, um, we are not building enough LNG export capacity to handle the predict predicted increase in associated natural gas that will come out of the Permian. Mm. Which is why so, natural gas is trading at $2 per million BTU in the U.S. You know? <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. So in conclusion, natural gas is going to zero. Uh, uh, in some parts of the country, it could go negative. Um, mm -hmm. Like literally, they would have to pay um, They would have to pay people to take it off their hands. Yeah. Mm. It, I, I've been watching that chart. And as, as someone who has contrarian tendencies, my hands have been itchy figuring out how to, how to, how to, take a position where nobody wants to take a position, but it just keeps falling. Um, well, you should look at the Waha chart, you know, which is Western Texas. And then you can look at the SoCal readings out in California, because again, even within the United States, there isn't one natural gas price. Henry Hub is the sort of um, the benchmark, but the price of natural gas in the US is incredibly regional. Mm. And, um, and so there's a variety of ways to look at that market. Uh, whereas like with oil, because it's so easily shipped, WTI and crude are pretty, and Brent crude are pretty tight. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but even within the United States, which is a point we're going to make in a piece, there's vast differences in price um, for, for, the pro for the product because it's so difficult to move. And so you have these unique little scenarios where, you know, the, the increment of growth in US is coming with associated natural gas, which in, a, in, in an ideal world, those oil producers would prefer to not have any natural gas coming. They can't get rid of it. Um, and so it's a pretty fascinating little concept and that's what we're going to write about next. And so I'm always happy to be talking about what I'm writing about because, you know, I'm writing about what is most interesting to me at the time. So there's not, 
it, it sounds like it's a little bit different than other commodities, at least, where you, you, there's not, you cannot look at the marginal cost of production and just assume that, okay, if it is below the marginal cost of production, it's not going to stay there for too long, so it might be worth you know, nibbling away. So this is where we open the piece with our experience in the commodity sector, where we talk about um, byproduct economics, because um, what is the marginal cost of production of a byproduct? Zero. Um, so in some cases, it could be negative. Yeah. And so take, take for example, <clears throat> there's uh, we don't we decided not to probably include this in the piece, but there's a, the so-called possum process in the chemical industry, which is propylene oxide and styrene monomer made together. Um, and if you know the demand for propylene oxide skyrockets. If you're running a possum process where you're making both propylene oxide and styrene monomer, you have to find a home for that styrene monomer to meet the demand of propylene oxide. And you could really crush the styrene monomer market because you just don't care because the, the margins are so high on propylene oxide. Well, then uh, from a sort of accounting perspective, how do you attribute the cost of running that plant? Mm. Right? Um, do you load up the cost on styrene or do you, do you do it on propylene oxide? Well, you know, a great example of this, which we do talk about in the piece, is the fact that the reason why all of the roads in the U.S. are paved with asphalt is because you needed to do something with the bitumen that came out of a barrel of oil. And so, you know, the primary products of oil refining are diesel and gasoline and jet fuel. But you have to do something with every molecule in the barrel because even a small percentage of it sort of stacking up somewhere becomes untenable. Mm. And so we we slap asphalt on our roofs, even though metal roofs are superior, and we we pave our roads with asphalt because uh, we have to do something with these gigatons of, of bitumen coming out of these refineries. And so um, hmm. this byproduct economics. So if you're a pure natural gas producer, dry natural gas, say, um, you know, in Appalachia, your EQT, and you're drilling for and, and um, bringing natural gas to the market for the sake of it, your cost structure and your view of the world is different than if you're an oil producer who's getting natural gas, a nuisance really, as a consequence of every barrel of oil you're bringing up. And so um, to the oil producer, what is their cost basis for natural gas? Negative, perhaps. Um, they, they could pay people to take it away from them and they would still make profit on the oil. Whereas if you're a pure play, so this is an example. If you've got a, a factory that makes styrene monomer on purpose and only styrene monomer, you're pretty annoyed at the possum producer down the road who is producing as much propylene oxide as possible and dumping styrene onto the, onto the market. And so... In this analogy, the producers in, in the uh, Permian Basin are basically the possum producers. They're producing oil as fast as they can because oil is $80 a barrel. And they're getting all this natural gas that they have to do something with. And so they just dump it onto the market. Um, and so it's a really fascinating sort of microcosm of, of economics that, that those are the types of situations that make for the sort of quintessential Doomberg pieces. Mm -hmm. So... It almost sounds like you cannot afford to be a brainless contrarian, just be contrarian for the sake of being contrarian. This sounds like a much more complicated trade than it than it yeah. seems to be. Well, again, it got warm in Europe for the winter, mm -hmm. right? And Freeport yeah. uh, LNG export exploded, quote unquote, and was slow rolled back into production. You know, uh, it's, it's amazing coincidence that as soon as the U.S. was through the winter, suddenly Freeport uh, LNG exports were back to full rates and. And then you have to do the math, do the math, like how much LNG export capacity is coming online. That's knowable. You can go to the the, um, the, the DOE and, and find out. And then what is the predicted predicted growth rate, uh, predicted growth rate of the Permian Basin for oil? How much associated natural gas is coming with that? And um, what's the flows? And in a world where we don't use it because you know we are um, pushing wind and solar. And we're not approving new natural gas plants, even though we're still burning coal. Um, and we can't export it. Where does it go? And 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 then you mix in some mild weather. Now, the U.S. had a pretty mild winter as well, and storage is at you know historic highs. Mm. Um, and same thing in Europe. And so suddenly, um, with oil going up, natural gas could collapse in the U.S. I'm not. We're not calling for it. It could be a bottom. I mean, who knows? I mean, some flow might materialize that we're not modeling or can't see, such as the nature of you know, nonlinear systems like uh, mm. economic commodities. But if you just sort of drill out at back to your 40,000 foot level, mm. um, that natural gas would trade at 50 cents or 25 cents is not that meaningful to oil producers in the Permian Basin who are looking at $85 Brent or, you know, a, a 82, 83, $84 WTI on mm. the way higher potentially if China reopens. So in a world where oil goes to $100 a barrel, 
um, counterintuitively, you can see natural gas prices fall even further because there's going to be the signal to produce more. Um, and as a consequence, you get way more associated natural gas and, and you don't have a home for it. Hmm. So I was going to bring up coal uh, trading under 200, um, which still seems to be above the marginal cost of production. Would that, I mean, we're not going to stop using it, but when it comes down to investing speculate on coal, um, what, what do you make of the price of it now? Uh, it's probably fairly priced for its use. You know, at the, at one of the things we noted in 2022 was that on an energy basis, coal became more expensive than oil, which is a historic anomaly. That uh, relationship has now uh, regressed back to historical means. And in our view, is a sign that the, uh, the quote, energy crisis um, is abating. $200 coal is a wonderful price for, for the average coal producer. Yeah. Um, and they will be making a lot of cash um, at that price. Um, $400 coal or $450 coal is a, a crisis territory. And, um, and, and we are pleased to see that coal has come down to more reasonable levels. Um, same thing with natural gas. Now, natural gas in the U.S., as we said earlier, is, is really um, at glut pricing uh, for a variety of idiosyncratic reasons that are unique uh, to the region. Mm-hmm. But um, coal is trading at a price that is uh, correct relative to oil uh, vis-a-vis historical relationships and also at a price where coal producers um, will be properly motivated to keep increasing supply because at these prices they could earn uh, their cost of capital and a reasonable return uh, uh, beyond that. Well, you're just setting up the stage for uranium here because you're mentioning on an energy <laughs> basis the price and the price at which producers are happy to produce because they have a good return on on investment there. You know, you're bringing uranium into the mix and that immediately shoots up to to the top of the chart as the most undervalued, right? Yes, although um, uranium is kind of unique in the sense that the cost of uranium is relatively irrelevant to the operation of a nuclear power plant. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. on the one side, uh, the bullish side, that means uranium could double or triple or quadruple and basically nobody would care. Um, mm-hmm. But on the other side, uh, it given how long, you know, the these fuels can be stored and pre-bought uh, at historically low prices. It's going to take a long time to, to sort of burn off all of that residual inventory and get the price of uranium to a point where um, some of the, you know, that if you just look at the cost curve of uranium miners, um, there's an awful lot of excess inventory on the sidelines. And so, um, you know, it's trading what around $50, I guess, uh, in the past few weeks in, in the lower 50s. It seems like it's been there forever. Um, that's sort of double the sort of historical lows, um, but not quite as high as many people, including us, thought it might go. Um, and so it's just sort of there around $50, and uh, and then we'll see what happens. But there's no question that sort of the momentum behind nuclear is there. The transfer function of that momentum into the price of uranium is is, is a different question. Mm, mm. You said nobody would care if it doubled, tripled, or quadrupled. My wife would be extremely happy, and she would care <laughs> a lot. Producer, yeah, the power, power but companies I know could, could, could handle it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, I'd be happy. We have many friends who are in the uranium trade, and uh, we we like to see our friends make money. And so, hmm. Hmm. It, so is is it fair because we went sort of through the the, the four main energy commodities is it there? Is it is it fair that you you would be more bullish to say that you would be more bullish on the energy commodities than you would be on something like the battery metals, specifically like you know cobalt, nickel, lithium? Yeah, the battery metals are are priced pretty rich relative to historical. I mean, nickel's come down a bit. Um, lithium's come down a bit. Mm. Uh, the challenge with these metals is um, all it takes is one constraint for the anticipated demand not to realize, right? And so uh, just imagine if if, if um, we don't have enough lithium. Well, what does that do for the long-term projections of demand for nickel and copper and cobalt? Um, of course, it means those projections are probably overstated. You know. It, it takes one zero in a geometric mean to know what the answer is. And so, um, but um, we would be broadly bullish oil. Um, we would be carefully observing the U.S. domestic natural gas market. Um, and we would be bullish uranium. And we would be market neutral on coal. Um that's sort of at least from a demand perspective. You know, all these things could be wrong, of course, and it's not financial advice, as you started the show by correctly saying. Um, I think that there is a a cartel, literally, 
of oil producers that would like to see 80 to 100 dollar oil and that puts a bit of a floor under the price of oil whereas um, with natural gas as we described it's a whole different dynamic and then coal is sort of properly priced and and then um, uranium has this little challenge of the of the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust not being redeemable, which means that it could trade at a significant discount to NAV. And so um, there's all kinds of challenges uh, in these markets that one needs to be aware of before putting your investment dollars to work. But mm. um, from a high level view, that that's how we would characterize our stance on, on those commodities. Given what you told me previously about your view on the macro, would it also be fair to assume that you're not bullish on industrials, among which I, I want to throw copper in there as well? Yeah, copper is difficult to model because, of course, um, there is a strong push to electrification, and and there, are, no matter what the battery packs uh, are, um, uh, copper is going to be in high demand. Uh, you know, if any of this actually um, happens, and of course, let's just look at China. Um, you know, the, the EV penetration in China is pretty significant, and so, um, but um, broadly speaking, we would be hesitant around names that are um, linked to the economic cycle. And you're already beginning to see in some of the data, you know, Amazon struggling, um, you know, uh, Costco, pick your favorite sort of bellwethers. Um, I keep an eye on FedEx and UPS, um, sort of the standard sort of um, recessionary type plays. Um, chemical industry is a bit of a mixed bag for a variety of reasons because their input costs um, uh, swing uh, almost as much as their demand. Um, so they're a little bit more challenging to study from a superficial level. Um, we'd watch commercial real estate, you know, stay at home, work from home is is finally dawning on some people that this might be a pretty significant trend. Um, and so, yeah, but back to our original point, you know, regional banks uh, make us um, bearish on the on the economy at large. Mm -hmm. And therefore the the manifest, but surely sooner or later the the supply shortages in in the production of copper and, and some of these other metals will also have to show up in in the pricing, right? Yeah, and, and to the extent that um, they have, I mean, if you pull up a price of lithium, the, the, you know, it, it's in there. If you pull up nickel, it skyrocketed to fifty, sixty thousand. Now it's back around twenty thousand, still very high relative to historics. Um, you know, copper is a whole different business as we talk about, but uh, yeah, for sure. I mean. And in a world where the Fed pivots and we, you know, fire hose the economy with liquidity, then all bets are off, of course. Mm -hmm. Is that what it's going to take, in your opinion, for, for risk to come back onto the markets? And 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 this is actually sort of a, like a chain question, but it's a, does it take risk coming back onto the markets for the things like uranium that you're bullish on to move? And does it take the Fed pivoting for risk to come back. And am I making any sense here? Yeah, I would say if you take a sector specific question like uranium, you could imagine a world where, um, you know, the West makes a heavy investment towards nuclear and the nuclear opponents are finally drowned out by the more sensible members of the environmental movement. And you could see nuclear beginning to take more market share, even in a contracting environment. And that would still be okay for uranium. There are such scenarios. I'm not saying they're likely. Um, whereas for sort of more traditional, economically sensitive um, industrial stocks, um, I, th I think there's no avoiding it. If our if our original hypothesis of the market currently underpricing the risk of a credit crunch in the United States uh, is true, then um, you know it, it, uh, you would think that you know the, the direction of the market in the next weeks and months would be to the downside. Okay, so I mean, if, so what you're saying is that if 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 there was something to decouple, I'm not saying that something would, but if there was something to decouple, that would be uranium as opposed to the industrials. Yeah, because you know uranium has one use, which is nuclear yeah. power, and so if the G7 got together and said like nuclear is green and it's critical, and um, we're going to systematically replace coal plants with nuclear power wherever we can. Um, and we're going to um, sanction um, Russian uranium, for example, and invest in homegrown uranium. Um, there are lots of scenarios where uranium could could fly in a contracting economy. Yeah, very difficult to find those scenarios for FedEx, 